Hi everyone, welcome to the Navigant Credit Union Broadcast Center. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Go Local Live. I'd like to welcome John Delavope, pollster at Harvard and Social Sphere. John, thanks for joining us today. Good morning. It's good to have you back as we were back in the field since October. A lot has changed since then. Yes, and um, we we're very, very excited. We, we just got out of the field this past Monday. We spent four or five days in the field and we conducted 500 interviews with likely voters um, in the upcoming November general election. So I want to just kick off with the governor's race and just want to let viewers know as well, as you said, perhaps maybe a one day overlap. A lot's been happening with the Raimondo administration this past week. Administration issues, some legal woes, as well as fundraising questions have arisen. But again, this was done just prior and a little bit going into that as well. So I wanted to start, um, John, with the head to head. If it were Alan Fung in the Republican, emerging from the Republican primary, Gina Raimondo, Joe Trillo as an independent, dead heat between Fung and Raimondo. It literally could not be any closer. As I said, we spoke to 500 Rhode Islanders, and currently Mayor Fung and Governor Raimondo are separated by one single vote. They essentially each have one third of the electorate with independent candidate jo Joseph Trillo at 19%. So this race could not be closer. Um, overall, I, I see about half of the overall electorate are really very hesitant right now in terms of which direction they're going to go. And uh, this is going to be a very, very dynamic, dynamic race over the course um, of the next couple of months. So let's talk about that, that third party looking at Joe Trillo. There are other independent candidates. Now, of course, Joe Trillo, the campaign honorary campaign chair here for President Donald Trump, 16%, Joe Trillo, 18% don't know. Were you surprised by that Joe Trillo number capturing that amount? Compared to other, I saw other polls conducted over the last couple of months where he's in the single digits, but I can't be surprised for a couple of reasons. One is Robert Healy got 21% you know, in the last election, number one. So that's a, it's an interesting kind of baseline for, an, for, for a candidate one. The second is um, we have, you know, in an administration and overall kind of political culture where folks are just unhappy and dissatisfied. So the fact that we see kind of an independent, non-traditional party candidate pulling at this level currently is also kind of not surprising. But again, th these things are very, very early and um, things will, will likely kind of evolve as we as we get closer. But that's a, at this point, we asked this question several different ways, and that's a solid, you know, 15 to 18 points that the independent candidate is pulling and that, under that scenario. And what do you see as, as the Trump factor in there, John, with, with Trillo's clear Trump ties? Well, that clearly kind of, uh, um, kind of is one thing that can, can connect to a base of support right now. And we see actually a similar base of support for Mayor Fung at 19%. His not, we, we did something actually, okay, if I could take one step back, rather than just the traditional horse race where we say, who are you going to vote for between this candidate and that candidate? We actually tested a variety of scenarios. We tested nine individuals. And I think that is the news here because it's in some ways it's unfair to call someone up or to email them and ask them who they're going to vote for today. That very well could change, you know, tomorrow or next week. And we have no way necessarily of knowing that. So what we did was, um, in addition to those traditional horse race measures, which again show a basically a statistically tied or tied race, we said kind of what's the, the, the likelihood of supporting a variety of candidates on a scale where I would never ever vote for this person mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. I'm absolutely positively gonna vote for this person. We had a five point scale. And when we do that, well, we can see a couple of things emerge. We can see that Overwhelmingly, Governor Raimondo and Mayor Fung of the other candidate of all the candidates we tested have a have um, clearly kind of advantages. Not surprising. One. Second thing is the 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 base of the Allen Fung vote is the most committed of any base of support that we can currently see. There's about 19 percent of the electorate who seem a very very sure to kind of vote for him. There are three other segments that are kind of worth talking about in the overall context. Um, one is this kind of 55 percent, as I say, certainly more than half of the electorate. At this point, I'm very hesitant. You can vote in, for almost any candidate. And this is going to be um, a key group. Half of, of Rhode Islanders are still going to be waiting till very late, I think, in the cycle to find someone that they can trust and kind of connect with 
and make them feel better about themselves and the state moving forward. That's that's second. We have a, a third. We have a third group that could vote for any Democrat or independent, regardless of who the Democrat is. Okay, and then we have a we have a fourth group that is um, is is again, open, but opposed to uh, one or two particular kind of candidates who seem to be kind of off uh, off of the spectrum in terms of how they think about things. So it's really a kind of about a progression of likelihood to vote rather than just are you for one candidate or the other candidate. You raised that interesting point about asking about those individual candidates. We'll put those numbers up on Go Local for folks to see as well. Want to just go through a couple of, again, of those hypothetical head-to-heads, but as you said, there's so much room for the undecideds. But I want to go through some of these numbers. If Chino Raimondo emerges from the Democratic primary versus a Patricia Morgan, 39%, her numbers go up, Patricia Morgan at 20, Joe Trillo at 19 in that scenario. So uh, a, a, a bit more of a margin than versus a, Trillo, uh, versus a Fung. And again, I think that kind of connects with the first point that I made about the kind of the fun constituency being kind of stronger and more committed. But it also shows something similar to what we what we shared in the October poll, where you can ask the question a bunch of different ways. I find it very difficult um, of a pathway at this point for the governor to get into the mid 40s. You know, so she was elected in the low 40s and she's continued to stay there. And as you can see in a, in a hypothetical matchup against Patricia Morgan, that's where she essentially is now at 39 percent. That needle, that needle does not move. And let's talk hypothetically if Matt Brown were to prevail. And I want to talk a little bit about his candidacy as well. A Matt Brown, Alan Fung, Joe Trillo matchup has Alan Fung at 35 percent, Matt Brown at 25 and Joe Trillo dipping a little bit to 14, but don't know at 27. I mean, that's a high number of, of don't knows. And let's just talk a little bit about these Matt Brown scenarios. Yeah, you know, um, to be fair, I think there are a couple different factors, one of which is the information that the respondents or the likely voters had was just his name and his party. So we didn't have the opportunity like we would in other polls to share information about a bio or anything like that. So you really dealing with a relatively, I think, low name ID at this point, and we can see the deficit that um, he's taken because of, of, of that. And I think certainly why, why we have the undecided, and the, say the undecided 27, Kate, I think it's much higher than that because of the hesitant voter uh, factor that we talked about. But interestingly enough, Matt Brown head to head with Patricia Morgan has Matt Brown emerging as a victor with 30%. Patricia Morgan at, eight, at 20, Trillo 18, don't know 33, again, that, that don't know would decide it. But Interestingly enough, versus Patricia Morgan, it looks like he would be ahead of her in that scenario. He would, and again, that's that's the fun factor. You know, the Alan Fung factor. You take him out of it, and then if it's a Democrat over Republican, there's you know far more Democrats and Republicans. I think that's what's driving you know that kind of scenario right now, where name ID is extremely low, and 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 not only that, but so isn't the kind of the background, the perspective, and the policy positions. I think of each of those campaigns. Let's talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> the Pawtucket Red Sox here. The question is a big question, clearly, as the House Finance uh, Committee looked at new legislation. But the very simple question, Rhode Island General Assembly is in the process of negotiating $40 million in public financing for the Pawtucket Red Sox for a new stadium, hoping to bring a vote before the House and Senate this summer. In general, do you oppose, favor, or oppose the use of public funds to help finance a new stadium for the Pawtucket Red Sox Net opposition, 59%, with 38% strongly opposing. Yes, and that is, um, you know, these questions are kind of uh, difficult and sometimes challenging to, to write and to understand. We really want to make this as simple as possible for Rhode Islanders and, 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 and likely voters to understand. And so the key point, key point, I think, is generally speaking, do you favor or oppose use of public funds to support in this case, the Paw Sox Stadium. You can see um, three out of five Rhode Islanders, it was consistent from the first day to the last day that we were in the field, oppose that. 38% is a very strong number. I think I probably said back in October, whenever you have 40% you know, strongly feeling one way or another way, that is something that you have to, you have to know that's an incredible amount of intensity for 38 or close to 40% feeling that way. So yeah, I think it's very, very clear where Rhode Islanders are kind of on this issue. But to put this into context, um, yes, the economy is going well, job growth is happening, those things are good. But we still see that 
the number one issue facing the state now is taxes in, in within the top five are state finances. So there is a disconnect, I think. It's an uphill battle selling any proposal like this in this current environment. It has something to do with the PAW SOX and, and, and the way in which that's been handled, but it has a lot more to do, I think, with the overall state, the lack of, of kind of trust and uh, relationship between voters and elected officials. They're just not necessarily kind of trusting what um, I think you're hearing every day out of the General Assembly. And let's talk, speaking of juxtapositions, uh, another bond referendum question that looks to be going on the ballot, the $250 million in financing for school renovations. Now, you talked about voters' support in this situation here. Let's talk about net approval rating, 74%. Warm, safe, and dry versus ballparks. Well, the Rhode Islanders have always been committed, I think, to kind of investing large sums of money on things that uh, provide infrastructure, provide access to education, provide essentially kind of improved quality of life for all Rhode Islanders. They have never been afraid to invest in those kinds of programs, and that's what we're seeing here. You know, uh, 74 percent again, incredibly high. You have got significant majorities of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, regardless of who we ask or where we ask. So that's an interesting kind of juxtaposition, kind of a relatively small project um, that doesn't necessarily kind of connect at this point to helping all Rhode Islanders versus investing in, in schools and infrastructure. So one of the things you had mentioned, this is a question on the poll that we'll be putting out as well, the top issues according to Rhode Islanders. I just want to take a step back to John and talk a little bit about the difference from what we saw in October and what we're seeing now, now topping the list from this recent time in the field, taxes, jobs and economy, and state budget. Top three economic issues. Back in October, I mean, education was ranked even higher. Only three of the top five were pertaining to um, economics. And so this, what's your sense that taxes now really jumping to the top in jobs and economy and education maybe moving down? What's, what's folks' sense about the economy and concern? Now, I think so. A, a couple of things that um, I, I've noted. I think education uh, has 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 remained um, a, a top issue. You know, it moves a couple of points here and there, but it's essentially um, in in any way we ask a poll, it's going to be a it's going to be a top it's going to be a top tier issue, especially in Rhode Island. So that's one. But as the economy has improved, as there's been more access to jobs and higher wages, we see the overall bucket of um, more jobs, unemployment going from one to two or three. And then we see taxes and state budget kind of moving up on the list. And that's what we're seeing now. Whereas you know, people, people feel kind of more comfortable and now thinking about, you know, our, our, you know, kind of the folks that represent us investing kind of our tax money properly. People aren't necessarily opposed to paying taxes. They just want to ensure that the money that they are investing, the money that they're giving to the state is being used in the best way possible, um, you know, in an efficient, transparent way. That's the rub. It's just not about not wanting to pay taxes. Yes, they want to have kind of a fair tax climate to, uh, to you know, to uh, provide job incentives and other things, but they want to have faith that the money is being invested in the proper way. I think you probably hit the nail on the head. And one of the, there's two questions I want to talk about, John. And again, this is right track and wrong track. And then we'll go to optimistic and pessimistic and talk about the differences there. But in yes. general, would you say things in Rhode Island are headed in the right direction or are they off on the wrong track? Right track, 19%. Wrong track, 36%. And mixed, 45 Yeah, and that's an, an important thing that I want to note. This survey, um, and there are a lot of good reasons why we chose to do this, but we conducted the survey online. You know, one of the reasons is that A, it uh, provides the response. We don't need to bug someone at five o'clock or six o'clock when they're trying to sit down to have dinner um, or, or, or to take a phone call from a number they don't you know, recognize, okay? So we believe this methodology allows people to take it when they want to take it and also be, in, in some cases, be a little bit more honest and not feel like they have to give a politically correct answer when you have someone calling them and asking them for, for questions. So we took it online. We t when we take, when we conduct the survey online, Kate, we, in this case, we provide the option, rather than a volunteer, the option of mixed, okay? So this is a half, you know, full versus half empty um, scenario. 19 plus, I think you said 45, uh, say mixed. You can argue that two thirds 
think things are at least somewhat going in the right direction. Okay, so um, now it really kind of depends upon, I think, kind of the candidates for governor to argue how much and why are things moving kind of in this right direction. Um, so clearly we see Democrats far more likely than Republicans and independents to say things on the, on the right track, you have a third, but you only have 30% of Democrats. Okay, so we said 19% of everyone statewide, but only 30% of Democrats. So um, again, the argument, the, 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 the key thing here is things are mixed, voters are hesitant, and they're looking for leadership and looking to, to have some kind of faith in the system to move things ahead. From a national perspective, I think they feel okay in terms of the economic um, indicators, but um, locally and kind of with the state of politics and democracy, there's this real concern, and you can see that, I think, reflected in those numbers. So let's break down again, as you talked about the right track, and going back to what we saw for the numbers for some of the head-to-head -head numbers in the gubernatorial race. If, again, that number is as high as two-thirds of Rhode Islanders think it's on the right track, uh, why is the governor or dead heat with or, mix. or, or mix. mixed? <laughs> Again, the, why does the governor find herself four years later in a dead heat with a potential Republican challenger? Yeah, and, and um, she has such a you know the the art of politics is to kind of expand the base, expand the franchise, and that for whatever reason that just hasn't happened. So she's kind of stuck in this place where somewhere you know we in the low thirties to, to to high high thirties to. 40, 42 percent. There's been kind of a lack, I think, of ability to connect um, with the Rhode Island electorate for some reason. I don't live there. I, I, I don't kind of engage with Rhode Islanders on a every single day basis. But um, it's something that the economy has gotten better. The economy has gotten worse. Those numbers essentially have stayed pretty, pretty, pretty much within the same fairly narrow band um, for her. There's time, you know, uh, oftentimes, it may, sometimes it's easier um, to tell your story in a, in a competitive campaign environment because you can position against someone else or in this case, maybe a couple of other people. So we'll see what happens. It's a very, very fluid race. Um, but there is opportunity to tell a story. Let's talk about that 30% number of the Democrats thinking the state is on the right track. Does this speak to the what we are seeing locally and nationally growing rift within the Democratic Party? Obviously, we saw Bernie Sanders Sanders prevail over Hillary Clinton here in sixteen. What is what does that thirty percent number indicate? I think it's pretty low. You know, I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty low um, for the party of the incumbent governor to have uh, to feel like things are not going kind of in the right track. And there are a lot of other indications as well that indicate that. Um, the governor um, doesn't have as much support within the party um, that is going to be required for her to win the election, frankly. You know, that she needs to really maintain, I would argue, you know, what, 75, 80, 85 percent of the likely Democrats to kind of to build that coalition. And right now that is that is very, very soft. Um, folks um, who are Democrats are looking um, I think in other options, including Matt Brown, and we'll see what happens over, over, the next, over the next couple of months. What's interesting, though, when we talk about being challenged from the left, is we've seen consistently now in this poll back as well as in October that she continues to do pretty well with younger, um, with younger Rhode Islanders. You know, folks, you know, in their 20s and 30s, I have a sense that they will vote at higher numbers than they typically do during midterm election years. We'll we'll see, um, and and that's going to be a, a something I'm going to want to really kind of look at moving forward for for Matt Brown to win. He absolutely needs to capture that part. Um, that, that's certainly the some of the most progressive element. That's the one that you know that's the group that he's most comfortable with, as was uh, Bernie Sanders. So that could be a real kind of battle line there in terms of where those young voters are going to be moving to. In your opinion, is, is there a path for a Matt Brown? Uh, I, absolutely, there is a, a path um, for Matt Brown. You know, um, again, I think it starts with expanding the franchise, you know, um, in, including kind of really kind of focusing on, as I said, young people, moving some kind of independence um, towards, um, you know, to choose that, that ballot um, in, uh, in September. But there's absolutely kind of a path. Um, yeah, as I said, 30 percent of the party of party participants believe that things, you know, are not perfect. They're not all headed in the right direction. Only 30 percent thinks they're headed in the right direction. 70 percent say they're mixed or, or, or wrong track, which means their eyes are open. 
And let's talk as well. You talked about now. We're going to be careful. That <clears throat> a driver, a big driver, though, is remember is taxes and state finances and these sorts of things. Okay, so it is going to be difficult to kind of to thread, I think, a needle where, on one hand, we're going to talk about kind of you know kind of progressive ideology that could resonate. On the other hand, we deal we do need to deal with the understanding in terms of you know taxes and state finances being such a critical factor. And let's talk again, you had mentioned, you know, looking for each individual candidate and the, the respondent's likelihood of voting for that person. Yeah. Paul Roselli, Spencer Dickinson, Luis Daniel Munoz, uh, others in the race as well, Giovanni Ferrosi. Is, is there a path for any of these other candidates from what you've seen here from your polling? Um, at the, again, at, at this stage, it's, it's, I think it's difficult. I never say never. Um, but um, especially in an environment where there's so much, you know, kind of uh, disdain for so many kind of traditional elected officials. So you never say never, but it, at this stage, based on what we're seeing, Raimondo and Funks clearly have advantages that no other candidate has based on about what's seeing. But um, again, I remember, you know, some of the Harvard polling in the spring of 15 among young people, Bernie Sanders had 1%. You know, um, six months later, he was leading the Democratic field with young people. So you, you never know what happens um, in this. But um, then that's why we we ask these kinds of questions. Are you open? Mm. And, uh, and and folks are open to kind of a range of Democrats and independents. That's one point. Putting the resources together and the campaign together and messenger together. That's, you know, something else that has to happen. So as one of the big takeaways here, John, just those numbers of undecideds that we see in these matchups here, is, is that really one of the big X factors as we continue to look uh, moving forward towards November? Yeah, regardless of, of, I think, of kind of what any horse race poll shows in, in my poll or other polls, we have 55 percent, I'd, I'd argue, of the electorate is hesitant. OK, so that is an incredibly high number they're open to a variety of um of options and that's really kind of i think the lesson coming out of this is not even close to being decided it's going to be very very fluid and i continue to believe that that this race is going to be decided um not just on who's got a kind of a better economic policy or a, or a more clear view regarding health care it's going to be decided based upon who rhode islanders can trust with their finances moving forward what kind of um, administration um, will be will be kind of uh, kind of developed to move the state forward? Um, I think we're going to talk about it. But about half, if not slightly more than half, of the state, you know, wants to be in is optimistic about the kind of the longer term future of Rhode Island. They are willing to invest a quarter of billion dollars in school infrastructure. Um, they see kind of the the positive headwinds that are coming kind of throughout the region of New England and nationally. Um, and they want to have a better relationship with, uh, with government. They want to trust those elected, uh, you know, uh, elected officials. And I think that's gonna be a key factor. This is not gonna be just kind of a transactional sort of election. Um, and, and that's, and that's um, not easy to do. That's not, that's not easy to do. That takes, that takes time. And I think it takes a different kind of campaign, frankly. Being back in the field again here now, as opposed to last fall, anything surprise you in this poll, John? Um, good. That's a that's a good question. I think the taxes, the fact that taxes is moving to the top, is something that's a, that that certainly kind of surprised me. I can't say I'm surprised at what we saw with the Paw Sox because that does those kinds of numbers don't just happen in a state like Rhode Island. Those are the kinds of numbers we see on a national basis in terms of the overall low levels of support for publicly financing stadiums. I can't say that's surprising me. Um, I, I do think the, you know, the openness of 55% of the electorate being open was you know, perhaps somewhat of a surprise. But um, you know, there's another number that we, there's another, another question that we asked for the first time, which is in the views of Rhode Islanders, how do you view the state in terms of kind of corruption? Do you think that Rhode Islanders have it worse, that there's more public corruption, political corruption in this state compared to others? Or do we essentially kind of, you know, Rhode Islanders have it better? And, um, and, and we saw that over 60% of Rhode Islanders think that, you know, this is essentially the most politically corrupt state um, that they can think of that exists, that no one has it, no one has it worse. Um, that's not surprising, so having spent a lot of time in Rhode Island understanding how people think. 
but these are systematic challenges that need to kind of be overcome. And it sounds to me that um, anyone who's going to kind of surprise us, anyone who's going to kind of emerge from this field is going to have to kind of tap into that lack of trust and deal with it. And you're not going to deal with it overnight. You need to deal with it by talking, you know, at length to the, you know, members of every constituency in the 39 cities and towns and really begin to talk about how to rebuild, you know, a government and an infrastructure that respects people, respects their time, respects their money, and um, is a, a really kind of a partner moving moving kind of the state forward. Um, and um, so that's kind of my how I how I, I kind of see things. Not a tremendous number of surprises, but um, it's always good to to quantify some of the qualitative insights that we might we might have. Well, we've certainly quantified them here at this last go in the field. We're going to be providing information, articles moving forward on Go Local Prov, breaking down the poll into individual segments, and we'll be releasing those today. But, John, we appreciate your taking the time to Skype in and give us the inside scoop as to what these numbers look like here as we're moving forth to the November election. Thanks so much for having me, Kate. Okay, thanks. I'm going to let care. John Delavope go here, but again, stay tuned to golocalprov.com for more poll information as we're going to be releasing it both throughout the day and tomorrow as well. You can catch it on golocalprov.com and on our Facebook page. We'll be at the State House this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We look forward to seeing you up there. We look forward to getting your feedback on the poll results. I'm Go Local News Editor Kate Nagel.